запущена запись. Вот, теперь запущена. Она отключилась почему-то, хорошо. Все, запущено, да? Теперь у вас запущено точно? Да. Да, она это самое появилось, что запись идет. Нет, важно, чтобы записывали и вы, и мы. Вот это очень важно. Потому что мы сейчас записываем на наш компьютер, но важно, чтобы вы записывали, как у нас получилось с Машей вчера. Ну вот очень надеемся, что все получилось. Uh, well, okay. Since everyone is here, let's start off slowly. Uh, good morning to everyone. My name is Pavel. I am from Stiklov Mathematical Institute, and I will be your chairman for today. We begin our second day with a second lecture on point processes and Hilbert spaces of holomorphic functions by Alexander Bufetov. <laughs> Okay, so let me begin. Uh, there was a uh, one of the formulas was written in wrong way yesterday. So the critical weight, in fact, I wrote in wrong way. So for one thing, I forgot to write for logarithm the exponent minus two. So it was just a mistake of writing. And of course, uh, to avoid singularity at zero, one should write one answer. So just this is correct formula for critical weight uh, yesterday, it was not written uh, correctly, I made a mistake in that one. Okay, so um, let us uh, start today. Uh, today we start with a um, uh, different class of examples, namely examples related to the Fox space. Fox space. So let us recall that the Fox space is the space of holomorphic functions uh, holomorphic functions uh, so in fact usually fox space is defined as space of holomorphic functions square integrable with respect to gaussian weight but for me it will be more convenient to include the gaussian weight into the definition of the function so i just write f equal to Phi times e to the minus z squared of two, where phi is holomorphic. So f belongs to L2 of C with respect to the back measure, with respect to the back measure, and uh, phi is holomorphic. Phi is holomorphic. So this definition is a little bit different from a standard definition in the sense that uh, we just put uh, this uh, holomorphic weight here rather than here, rather than here. It is also possible to define space of holomorphic functions just for integral Gaussian. Okay, so this Fox space, as it's space of holomorphic functions, it admits orthogonal bases, orthogonal bases. Is just basis of monomials. Is just the basis of monomials. So A is greater equal to C. Just and uh, uh, the reproducing kernel. The reproducing kernel. Is just the kernel K Z W equal to E to, to the Z W R minus Z square over two minus W square over two. I hope you can see W square over two. Is it okay, Pasha? Or not so much? What? Can you What? see W square over two? Is it not? Yes, okay? yes, yes. Okay, good, good. So this is reproducing kernel. So, and we have determinantal point process again. So point process for which correlation functions, the infinitesimal probabilities of particles at given positions is given by the determinant of K Z I Z J. So I J from one to K. So this process will be quite different from the process that we considered 
Чуть-чуть доску вверх подними, нижняя формула не видна. Не видна нижняя, да, срезается. А так? О, 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 о. Determinant of my process. Let me write uh, equivalent definition in terms of uh, in terms of multiplicative functionals. So the determinant of my processes is a probability on space of configurations on C, which is just the space of subsets of C without accumulation points. No accumulation points. So these are countable subsets, subsets, but the points in these countable subsets are not numbered. And uh, uh, the expectation of a multiplicative functional, the expectation of a multiplicative functional. So where uh, we recall that multiplicative functional is just product of values of a function over particles, product of the values of a function over particles. So expectation of multiplicative functional. Даже проблема. Нижняя строчка совсем не видна. Не видна, да? Это Васильевна, мне кажется, это у вас какие-то а, проблемы. Поп -поп Попробуйте да, на весь экран а сделать, видна, потому, что, да? потому что у меня видно. Говорю, а, у меня а, тоже. Так, неудобнее, конечно, потому что если связаться, то у меня совсем мало места. Uh, can you see lower line on the computer? Lower line? Yes. Вам видно, Маша, да? Да. Да, и мне видно. А, ну тогда, uh, Наташа, надо действительно можно на весь экран сделать, да. Uh, so I have uh, 1 plus g minus 1k, as we wrote last time, is the expectation of a multiplicative function, is expectation of a multiplicative function. So uh, the quite important characteristics of this process, which is common with the process uh, that we discussed yesterday, is the Bergman point process is a presence of radial symmetry. So, in fact, uh, one should keep in mind that determinant has some additional symmetries with respect to the kernel. And we can see this in the simple remark that the kernel that is written there is not a function of Z minus W. So, let me make a simple remark. Remark. The kernel is not translation. The kernel K is not translational. Is not translational. The process, the point process PK is is. Is translation invariant? Is translation invariant? And uh, the uh, so there are several symmetries. Of course, there is also rotational invariance for this point process. So all the isometries of the of C act on this process, just as the isometries of the Lobachevsky plane acted on the process. That we considered yesterday on the process of the disk. So, but uh, this process is the translation invariant. But there is also very important radial symmetry, radial symmetry for this process, radial symmetry for this process. So, and in this case, one can see that the operator one plus so radial symmetry, radial symmetry. If G 
Then the spectrum of the operator, the spectrum of 1 plus minus g minus 1 k, can be explicitly found. Can be found explicitly. Explicitly. So, what do I mean by this? What do I mean by this? Uh, so, um, just in fact, just the functions, the monomials, uh, it, 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 the monomials, the monomials g minus one, the monomials are the eigenfunctions. Eigenfunctions. This very naive, simple remark. Very naive and simple remark, which one must check quite directly, leads to the following quite uh, non trivial corollary. Sorry. Quite non trivial corollary. Corollary. Uh, corollary uh, to the effect that uh, what is the corollary? Uh, that uh, the distribution, the distribution of radial parts of the particles of the process is given by independent random variable. So this is absolutely key fact. So the distribution, so let us consider configuration X. Configuration X. And let us consider the configuration of absolute values, and it is important for me to write not just uh, absolute values, but in fact squares, which is values, it is done so for notational convenience. It is done the way for notational convenience. Uh, question? If any questions, please ask uh, 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 Alta Voce, because I cannot uh, hit see the chat. So, uh, if I consider the sum of delta masses at the radii of the process, then in law, in law, this sum is equal to the sum of delta masses at yk. Where yk are where yk are independent random variables are independent. And the distribution of yk has density gamma k1, maybe gamma k1. So that is to say, uh, t uh, to the k, e to the minus t over k factorial. Yes. So this is the test. So please observe, please observe that there is a difference. There is an important difference. So uh, the, I have a collection of independent random variables, but collection of independent random variables, but when I take the sum, the ordering of the summons is forgotten. The ordering of the summons is forgotten. So there is no, I don't know which one comes from y1, which one comes from y2, which one comes from y17, and so on. So, of course, these random variables are, to some extent, localized. They are localized, uh, this distribution. So, let us draw the graph of this distribution. So, sorry, Sasha. Yes, yes. It, it's a corollary of what? It's a corollary of the fact uh, this is excellent question. It's a corollary of the fact that the spectrum, so, okay, I answer this question. 
uh, the spectrum of 1 plus g minus 1k is found explicitly, as is written on the blackboard. Once I have found the spectrum, I can find this determinant explicitly. I can find this determinant explicitly. And in particular, I can find characteristic function, so uh, multiplicative generation function. Okay, let me, let me give uh, proof. So proof. So uh, Thank you. compute. Truth. Take disjoint, take disjoint angular. Take disjoint angular. And one. Take G equal. Set one. Uh, how does it take G equal to Z one on A one? Z K on A K. One after this. So in formula G is equal to one plus sum Z K. Multiplicative functional psi g, such multiplicative functionals, so expectations of such multiplicative functionals, co uh, determine this point process, this quotient point process, uniquely because point process is uniquely determined by occupation numbers, occupation numbers of uh, intervals, and intervals precisely correspond to any line once. And computing the expectation of a predictive function, we obtain this equality here. Yeah, this is the point. Yes, there is one more question, Hildar Abdulovich. Sure. Uh, question, вопрос? Нет, я вам ничего не я вам ничего не спрашивал. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, okay. So, uh, so yes. So, uh, so this is the proof for this statement, and the computation of the explicit. The explicit computation of the multiplicative function is possible because the spectrum of this operator is found explicitly, and the, and the determinant is just the product of eigenvalues. So, this is the proof of this proof. Okay, so I would like to point out so, how is now let us, one, we have proved it now, let us look at it more attentively. How does gamma distribution look? So, gamma distribution, it has maximum at k, so which is equal to one over, uh, roughly one over square root of k, roughly, and uh, on the order of one over square root of k. And then uh, it is uh, very well approximable by normal distribution. This is uh, classical asymptotic. I am uh, not even sure to whom it is originally due, but uniform asymptotics of this kind are due to Dicom in the 50s. So, and then it is possible to extend uh, then uh, the spread of this distribution is of the size of also square root of k. So, that's right. So, the expectation is k, uh, the variance is k, and the spread is the standard deviation. The standard deviation is also square root of k. So, and uh, it is well approximable by normal distribution in this in this uh, interval. And so the absolute values of the, the absolute values of the uh, particles behave as independent random variables. The absolute values of the particles behave as independent random variables. So it is interesting to contrast this with the statement on Gaussian pairs rigidity. The statement on Gaussian pairs rigidity. 
So the top of the blackboard is not visible, but okay, I will just. Is it okay, the top of the blackboard? Okay, so, uh, okay, so now let us contrast this with the Gaussian pair subject. So, uh, Gaussian phase rigidity will show us that the uh, particles have, in fact, very strong interaction uh, with each other. So, have very strong interaction with each other. So, just the Uh, the statement, which seems quite surprising at first, but in fact has uh, very, uh, very uh, short proofs, admits of very short proofs, is the following. So, and this is the question pairs, is the following. Take a, take a, uh, Bounded domain, for example, a ball. A ball is quite enough. So take a ball, a disk in the plane. So then the number of particles in the disk, so number of particles in the disk, say Gaussian number of particles in the disk, is determined, is determined. by the is determined by the uh, configuration outside of the disk by the configuration outside of the disk outside the disk So this statement might seem uh, quite counterintuitive at first, but in fact it has a very good uh, explanation in terms of the theorem of Colbar of the night in this. So, uh, but just uh, <coughs> of the night in uh, But just uh, let us look at the statement. So uh, the number of particles in the configuration is a random variable measurable with respect to the component of the configuration. With respect to the component of the configuration. So if I fix the complement, if I freeze the complement, then these particles determine the number of particles here. And this, as I said, this can be interpreted and in fact proved in terms of Kolmogorov's theorem for prediction for stationary processes, for interpolation for stationary processes. Uh, Omagorf was interested by predicting the present of a stationary process starting from the past and the future. And uh, uh, starting from the past and the future. And uh, this uh, prediction uh, from this Omagorf theorem of prediction, uh, the theorem of Gaussian pairs can be proved. And in fact, their line of argumentation, they don't even have been aware of work for but the line of argumentation is similar. And uh, this uh, Point of view is exploited in our joint paper with Dagowski and Gio. Okay. So now. May I interrupt briefly? Yes, yes, of course. Choosing Norway is a, is a Norwegian, is a Norway, Norway Q. Q is a Norway guy, Q. Where is Q? No, 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 he's in uh, France. Oh, Q is in France. Yes, yes, yes. Dabrowski is in France also. 
I'm sorry. No, 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 no. All the everyone in front. No, 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 one should say, also let me make a little addition, that while the number of particles is determined by configuration of time, by the way, comparing this result with the result on the independent random variables, one can see the importance of the uh, arguments. Of course, for this process, for the sum of independent random variables, it's not true. It's not true that the number of independent random variables inside is determined by independent random variables outside. It is always possible to add particle, remove particle, and so on. So it shows how the distribution of uh, arguments plays a part. Plays a part. Okay? So, okay. And uh, just uh, let me say, let me say that while the number of particles is determined by the configuration of side, the distribution, the distribution, and this is again John Portwood's view. So uh, the uh, conditional distribution of these particles, uh, of these particles uh, given the exterior, is determined, is an orthogonal polynomial sum, conditional distribution. Conditional distribution. Of the interior. Uh, given the exterior. Is, is an orthogonal polynomial ensemble. Is an orthogonal polynomial ensemble. Where W is also a product, and in fact, it is this product that we will mainly study in the second part of the book. Uh, mainly study in the second part of the book. So T over Z square. So where uh, Z are in the exterior. And the product is understood in principle value. This has to be explained more clearly, and in fact, I will. And in fact, I will. And in fact, I will. So, uh, okay. Now, now, uh, the uh, main point, uh, the main point in all these arguments, the key consideration is that the that is the formula for small variance for determinant of variance. Small variance for and what do I mean by small variance? For additive functions, for additive functions. Additive functions. So small, but by small variance, I mean that for small variance, by small variance, I mean that uh, if I consider now not multiplicative, but additive functional, so SF is the sum of values of the function f over all particles, then the variance of this additive functional is the integral of something that looks like Sobolev norm. So in, it is this expression that I wanted to look at okay, let me just try it more carefully.
dx theta. So, and let me look at this expression more carefully. Let me look at this expression more carefully. Let me consider two examples. Let me consider, uh, uh, let me consider uh, maybe the main, the most famous determinant of the process, the sign process, about which I will say a few words at the very end of this talk. So let me consider the sign process. So the sign process is the process with the sign kernel, which is the kernel of orthogonal projection onto the Pellegrino space. So S projects L2 of R onto the Pellegrino space, where the Pellegrino space is a space of functions, let us recall, of which the Fourier transform lives in minus R. Okay. So, and uh, just <clears throat> uh, in this case, this variance, the computation of variance, by the way, from determinant formula is a charming little exercise. So, in this case, this variance, if we write it, if we write it in this way, fx minus f of y excuse me fx minus f squared sine square x minus y and here I put x minus y so in fact sine square can be essentially neglected sine square can be essentially neglected and what we get is that the variance is comparable to one of the most important laws in the study of these processes, the Sobolev one half norm. So this is the Sobolev one half norm. It's not really norm, it's Sobolev one half semi norm. Sobolev one half semi norm. One half semi norm. Sobolev one half semi norm. And it is estimation of this Sobolev one half semi norm that controls the variance. So let me just let me just write this. The, the variance of additive functional is controlled by some one half semi The situation is quite different. The situation is quite different in Bergman space. The situation is quite different in Bergman space, also quite different, but I want to say in Fox space. The situation is quite different in Fox space. In Fox space. So let me, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me write some small variables that are difficult to work with. Let me write a solid one half semi -norm. Let me write it here. It's just this. It's just this. So uh, in bare one space, once we write, so uh, next proposition, proposition. So I need to be Fox space, excuse me, spoke. Proposition in Fox space, uh, the variance is dominated by H1 semi-norm. H1 semi-norm. H1 semi-norm. In fact, in fact, uh, let me give a proof. Let me give a proof. It's quite uh, direct, so I write the variance which is double integral of f z uh, plus w minus f of z. So one can check that what I get, what I get is e to the minus w square. Uh, one can check this from the direct formula that this square of uh, square of the kernel uh, in in Fox situation is equal to just exponential of minus x minus y square over two. Exponential of minus x minus y square over two. In fact, uh, this exponential decorrelation is what makes substantial difference between. Uh, in this exponential decorrelation here is what makes substantial difference between sine process where the decorrelation will be inverse quadratic. If we consider this square, it will decay as 
Square, inverse square is a distance, whereas here it is exponential, so this makes a key difference. Okay, so I have this expression, this w. I make Fourier transform and I write integral e to the i z and z minus one square. I make Fourier transform with one variable. So uh, f uh, hat uh, zeta square e to the minus zeta square over two is zeta z. So here I have just made Fourier transform. Okay. So and uh, uh, in fact already you can see that this is less than uh, obviously integral zeta square e to the minus zeta square over. Uh, let me continue somewhere else. So uh, just one second. Just one second. Let me. Uh, let me let me continue here. So we refine the definition by the space. So less than star. Continue. Uh, star less than uh, integral z square z square e to the minus z square uh, f hat z square z z. z. So the integral in zeta gives a co constant, and the integral in z gives me uh, z. There is something I'm not writing correctly. Uh, w. Excuse me. W. Excuse me. That's right. So the integral in uh, w disappears. Excuse me. Oh, I misread. Uh, okay. The integral in w uh, disappears. Uh, just yes, and so and I get precisely uh, integral zeta squared f at zeta squared in zeta, which is precisely Sobolev H one seminal. Observe the key difference between Sobolev one seminal, Sobolev one half seminal, and Sobolev one seminal. Sobolev one half seminal is invariant under dilations. Sobolev one half seminal is invariant under homotopy, whereas Sobolev one seminal is not invariant under homotopy. Is not invariant under homotopy. So, and uh, uh, just in fact, on the, at the same time. So now I'm ready to give proof of rigidity for point processes, a proof uh, in terms of this various SLS, proof of uh, Gauche and Perez, proof of Gauche and Perez. It is quite easy to construct. So let me go back here. So I want to have a fun, I want to determine that the values, the number of atoms in the disk is determined by configuration outside. But armed with the estimates on the variance, it is quite easy to construct additive functional, additive functional. So uh, in fact, proof. Uh, so proof. So proof construct additive function construct SF in such a way SFM in such a way that FM on the D on the D is equal to one, but the variance of goes to zero. And Fn has compact support. Support Fn is compact. Is compact. Uh, 
support of FN is compact. The variance goes to zero. SFN is a negative functional, and so therefore the number of partners in the disk is equal to uh, SFN minus ESFN. SFN of the SFN applied to configuration. SFN applied to configuration minus the disk. So the number of particles is equal to limit as n goes to infinity. Number of the particles is equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of SFN applied to the configuration beyond the disk minus its, minus its expectation. Minus its expectation. And this is the proof of the Gauche and Penis rigidity. This is the proof of the Gauche and Penis rigidity. OK, so the proof of uh, the, uh, the serum uh, joint with Chu. So let me illustrate it on the example of the sine process, because in the case of the sine process, I also want to formulate one more result. Uh, so uh, the uh, uh, in case of the sign process, by the way, in case of the sign process, uh, construct uh, the proof is exactly the same. The proof of the question of the answer is exactly the same. Observe, however, that the construction of this construction of this sequence of functions fn is different in case of sign process and in case of uh, uh, fog process because in case of fog process. It is possible to choose fn just by delaying one fifth function because observe that under delations uh, the one half norm goes to zero. The one half norm goes to zero under delation. So it is possible to it is possible to just argue by delations. But in sign process, it is, the argument is, is somewhat trickier. Or one can use Gaussian weights, uh, but uh, one needs to argue in a different manner. So let me for the sign process let me formulate a result. Uh, uh, a known result of mine from 2014. So, for the sine process, the conditional measure so for the sine process, the conditional measure or on the integral or on the interval on the interval minus one or let's say on some interval with fixed exterior, with fixed exterior, so this is fixed, and here there are some particles. So the conditional measure, conditional measure is the product of Ti minus J square. Times this weight, this weight, and product is a product. So, product over particles in the exterior outside. Uh, product and principal value. In this case, principal value just means summation over symmetric equals. So, and product from all. So, this is the whole of conditional measures. And let me just say that the proof relies on the statement that I briefly formulated last time, namely that. Uh, the main point in the argument is that the failure inner space satisfies the weak form of division axiom. Well, in fact, it satisfies also strong form of division axiom. But for our purposes, the weak form is enough that in failure inner space it is possible to divide if uh, in a function. If a function has a zero, then it is possible to divide by the monomial. So it is 
quite clear in perimeter space, and in fact, this distribution is similar to the distribution of orthogonal polynomial ensemble. And in fact, it is just the limit transition in orthogonal polynomial ensemble. So uh, this is just how this results. But let me just now say, let me just now say, uh, formulate this result and uh, uh, formulate the result is the following. So I said that in the part of there are n of them. N of them. And so the question arises, and how many are there n? How many n? And in fact, I formulated last time the result that the sine kernels over particles in the configuration span the perimeter space. Span the perimeter space. Span the perimeter space. And this is the result of Gosh in this setting. And as I mentioned in joint work with Xu and Shamov for general determinantal point processes. General determinantal point processes. In particular, the bare point processes that we discussed. Yes, sir. But now the question arises, so they span the perimeter space, but they span, but with what, how do I say, with what, how much do they overspan? How much do they overspan? For example, as I discussed for the bare space, if I remove finitely many particles, then in fact, still I get really, still I get equivalent process, so they span with infinite overkill, if I may say so. So if I remove any finite number of particles from the realization of that number of process, the remaining particles still span the background space. The remaining kernels still span the background space. So here, uh, here uh, the situation is quite different. And let me formulate the result that, in fact, uh, so this is on the archive uh, in 2019, so a year ago. Uh, uh, so if I take the realization minus one particle, minus one particle, so then this still span, span elevator space. But if it is minus two particles, I remember that this x minus p q, then they do not span, do not span the do not spend the space. And in fact, and in fact, and in fact, let me write quite clearly. So not only do they not, in fact, there exists a Pelliviner function. There exists a Pelliviner function. There exists a perimeter function. So just uh, so, okay. so there exists a perimeter function. A perimeter function of uh, just uh, F such that F in restriction to x minus pq is equal to zero. In fact, indeed, one take, one take, one may take product of one minus f of t, f of t equals to product one minus t over x, uh, x in x minus p of q, and this will be a Pelliviner function that is a node at this part. On the other hand, if I take the function product 1 minus t over x, x in x minus p, then this function is not in L2. And there is some sort of argument which shows that, in fact, this is enough. This statement, from this statement, it follows that this kind of management particles do not spend the Pelliviner space. And uh, before I conclude, let me just let me just uh, 
include a few words about the context of this result. So let us recall the Catania theorem. Let us recall the theorem of Catania. Let us recall the theorem of Catania, which says that the function in petty linear space is represented by a sum of cardinal signs. So uh, a function in perimeter space is determined by its values at integer points, and in fact is represented by orthogonal. This is orthogonal sum, orthogonal sum, and it represents the values of the function that uh, you know uh, it reconstructs the function for its values at integer points. And uh, this is exactly a starting point for this whole line of investigation, and in particular for results of yesterday. So the question is, is it possible to write such Katelnik of representation starting from uh, realizations of the sign process? And the answer is that, and so observe that for Katelnik of the set Z is both complete and minimal, and minimal. It's complete and minimal. So a function is determined by values at, at integers, but if I remove even one integer, it's no longer determined. It's no longer determined. Okay, so here the answer is the following: that uh, realization of sign process without one particle, without one particle, is complete and minimal realization of sign process without one particle is complete and minimal set for uh, the perimeter space. Is complete and minimal set for the perimeter space. And just to add one more remark. Uh, when we consider, it is quite possible to consider such question for Poisson process. Poisson process is much simpler. It is, it seems realistic, it seems realistic to prove such statement for Poisson process, such kind of statement. Curiously, for sign process, the determinable structure, so let me be very clear. Obviously, once this function belongs to the space, there is nothing so if here is function, it takes value zero, so the set cannot be complete because there is a function of perimeter space which is zero at the whole set, so this is clear. On the other hand, the converse, this function does not belong to L2, but maybe there, it is possible to somehow tame this function by considering some more complicated Weierstrass product and get it into L2. So maybe for Poisson, so here it is possible to argue that no, but in fact this relies on the classification of conditional meshes in sign process, which are on the topmost blackboard. But is it possible such argument for Poisson process? Because for Poisson process, maybe I can add some zeros uh, beyond the real line and get function which is in perimeter space. So for Poisson process, for Poisson process, just uh, this, I think, is a fascinating open problem, uh, which seems uh, quite difficult. But on the other hand, for sign process, it is possible to say that the particle of the configuration without the particle is confusing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alexander, for your wonderful lecture. Does anyone have a comment to make or a question to ask? Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Can, can you repeat what you said about the, the Poisson point process at the end? Well, well, well what should be the statement? Uh, statement should be the same. Is it? Is it? Uh, is it? Uh, uniqueness set is realization of Poisson process. Uniqueness set for for Pelevinian space. For pilevinia space, okay, again, okay, thank you. Yes, also for Fox space, also for Fox space. Is okay. Poisson process uniqueness set for Fox space? Okay. Yes. So this is the question. Okay. Do we have any more comments or questions? I I, I have a question. Yes, there is. So in it, well, there in in the case of the Berman. Berman space or Berman kernel, there is no Gaussian Paris result, right? 
There's no rigidity, I mean. No, 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 it's not true. Okay, As I mentioned, yeah. no, it's simply sure. not true. And you can also understand why, because somehow it is possible to write such formula for variance, it's possible. But if a function, uh, so if a function is one in compact set, then its variance cannot be arbitrarily small. It's possible to give some lower bounds. But also it is possible to prove, and we prove with Jan Shishu, that palm measure so, in fact, the fact that palm measure is equivalent to initial measure is proved by Holgren and Sue. And Jan Shishu and myself, we give explicit expression of Radonica derivative, which is also multiplicative functional, just as in case of sine process, but it is multiplicative functional corresponding to Blaschke product. Okay. So, in the sense of, in, in fact, the key point, it's very simple, and this is uh, uh, investigated in our work with uh, Shu and Shilei Fan just that in any, in any bounded domain, Bergman space is not rigid. Bergman space is not rigid. And it, is, it follows from the fact, very simple, it's even uh, just uh, somehow I uh, feel ashamed to mention such fact, just that multiplication by Z is bounded operator in bounded domain. Multiplication by Z is bounded operator in bounded domain. And, so and, from this, okay. it follows that palm measure is equivalent to initial measure. This work for any weight in, you mean, in, in bounded sets for any weight or just the weight? Uh... Oh, yeah, it's a very general result, of course, of course, very general result. The important part is that you, you may multiply by z, yes. Okay. But, any but, reasonable uh, way, yeah, yes, it's a very general result. Any, yeah. any reasonable weight, you need some assumptions, but yes, it is very general. In, in, in the complex plane, for instance, there, there are processes that, that are kind of interpolate between a better man, Bergman process and, and Geneva and the Fox space process. So for instance, uh, yeah. It, like what, like what? I'm, I don't know what you mean. Okay, well, for instance, you, you know, Geneva process, you can see it as a kind of a, a Coulomb gas generated by the, uh, with the, where the background is a uniform measure, the Lebesgue measure. If, if uh, yeah, because it's, it's a norm of X square or norm of C square whose Laplacian is, uh, so, so again, what? so you consider you consider Coulomb gas and potential is what? Is the norm of C square, for instance, the norm of C square, the norm, norm of. C that's cool, but this is exactly this is exactly yeah. Geneva. The, the, that, that is Geneva. Yeah. So Geneva is with that potential, and uh, but if you consider the potential that has Laplacian, uh, some potential that has Laplacian uh, Lebesgue measure at the left half plane and zero at the right half plane, you obtain another point pro another space yes. Yes. and this kind of well interpolates between uh, if, if but you want interpolates, interpolate. excuse me if i understand correctly what you say maybe i didn't quite understand when you say interpolate you mean it's one point in between yeah it, it, it's kind of you you can take a limit that gives no, or you, you have family do you say you have family which actually interpolates yeah you have a family because uh, but, I don't, uh, but excuse that, me David, i didn't understand what is the family you mentioned ah, if, if you take at uh, the left uh, the Lebesgue measure multiplied by lambda, you have a family in lambda that is positive. Of projections? Of, proje of, projections. of projections, yeah. yeah. If you can, take you lambda write, can you write formula for this family explicitly? I, or to be honest with you, I have never seen this. I think it's a very interesting question. Okay, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, well, I, I, I can find the, the, I can write the formula for, for the Yes, please, yes, one. please, very much. Yes, please, because I think it's a very interesting question in, in the sense that, uh, so you uh, just, Excuse me. Just to be honest with you, I really don't understand because, uh, as I as I wrote, as I wrote. So let me explain what I don't understand. As I wrote, the variance is dominated by L by excuse me by H one norm, and obviously once the variance is dominated by H one norm, you have uh, clearly rigidity because just you take uh, dilations of complex support function. But the point is, if I understood your interpolation scheme correctly for all intermediate values. Uh, so the fact, let me, let me reformulate, the fact that variance is dominated by a, a, a H1 norm, as you could see from the very simple proof, it only means that the Laplacian of the weight of the weight be between two positive constants. But if I understand correctly, in your intermediate examples, it's true. Because you say you take Laplacian, you take the big measure, and then you multiply it by something. But in intermediate situation, it will be between two constants. So either no. I did not quite understand your results. I'm, or... so, 
it would be very right. interesting that you can approximate this Bergman by something rigid, if I understand you correctly. This is very strange. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but uh, I'm going to announce a five minute break right now and you can go on talking. Uh, but we are out of time. Okay, okay, okay. Well, yes. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, yes. So just five minutes to... break till uh, I'd say one ten. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I was, I was, what I was saying is that you take the La, the Laplace and, and the right side of the of the plane, so at the right half plane, it's zero. So it, it's you cannot quite say that. You, you cannot bound the, the, the potential by two, two positive no, but constants. Second, what is the intermediate value, David? So what, what is intermediate? What do you interpolate with? OK, so no. Well, I, I, one, it, it, one, one parameter family, what is it? OK, so fix, well, you, you know that instead of fixing the potential, you can fix a measure, right? Well, exactly. The measure is the Lebesgue measure at the, at the right half plane. Times yes, lambda. It dies, times, it dies on the left half plane, right? Yeah, and, and on the left half plane, but at the right half plane, you have the measure zero. But you have, excuse me, you have measure zero at the end of the day when you get there, right? You have zero just uh, passing the, the, the vertical axis. So. No, just a second. So you're describing to me one parameter family of, of measures, right? Yeah, but. You yeah, understand correctly that one parameter is made like this. On one half plane, the measure is Lebesgue measure. On the other half plane, Lebesgue measure multiplied by lambda. So lambda is equal to one. In the no, no. It, so, 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 sorry. In the left half plane, you have, yeah, uh, you, you're right. It's, it's, it's not a, an exact interpolation because you, you have to translate afterwards. But the idea is you take. Well, OK, so but then okay. for intermediate values of lambda, you will have Laplacian of the, of the fog weight bounded by two constants, yes or no? No. That, that, ah, I, no, OK. But then but, it's very interesting. So can you write to me formulas for, for the weight, actually? Yeah. And, but, but, me. Ah, OK, so no. So you're saying then, then of course, what I said is just wrong. OK. OK, so let, let me describe you quickly the, the, the measure I'm saying you, to you is the, the Laplacian at the left and zero at the right. So, but so, I think that it, I think we can uh, we can, we have to stop because uh, okay. uh, 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 we need to start next talk quite soon. But maybe can you send me? Can you oh, send sure. me? Can you send me the formulas? Because if we look at the formulas, then maybe we can answer the question. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we'll thank do. you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Okay, let's get back to the conference. Our next speaker is Elena Manianini from University of Padova with a short talk on limit theorems for Levy flights on a one dimensional Levy random medium. Mm, please, Lena. Yes, now I share the screen. Okay. Okay. So um, good morning, everybody. I'm very happy to be here and to have the opportunity to, to um, have this seminar titled Limit Theorems for Levy Flights on One Dimensional Levy Random Medium, which collects the um, results of a recent work with Gianmarco Betta, Alessandra Bianchi, mm -hmm. Marco Lynch, and Samuele Stivanello. So the outline of my talk will be the following in the first, first part. I will explain a little bit the title and I will give some preliminary definitions. In the second part, uh, I will present the model together with our goal and uh, uh, I will speak a little bit of the space uh, of cardiac functions with the two metrics uh, J1 and J2. Um, and in the third part, I will give the results. So let me start from the title. Um, what is a Levy flight? So roughly speaking, we can think of a Levy flight as a set of random short movements connected by infrequent longer ones. So here in this frame, you can see the typical representation of a Levy flight with a big long jump here in the middle. And um, yes, its two main features are uh, long ballistic flights and clusters of short disorder motion, we can say. Um, so there are many situations that can be modeled in terms of levy flight from human mobility to also in some sense uh, internet uh, browsing. And um, yes, yeah, so for example, human beings spend the most of their, their time by uh, moving in a quite delimited area, then sometimes they take a plane and they fly far away, then they stay still for a while and then they move far away again and so on. So more formally, we can say that uh, a Levy flight is a discrete time random walk with jumps modeled by uh, random variables with heavy tailed distribution. So variables with uh, uh, infinite variance. So what do we mean by Levy random medium? We mean a stochastic point process in some space where the distances between nearby points have heavy tailed distributions. So for example, we can consider a random medium in the real line. We locate a sequence of random points, omega k, whose nearest neighbor are distances, uh, um, sorry, whose nearest neighbor distances are IAD and heavy tailed, heavy -tailed random variables. And, and then uh, we can consider when you say heavy tailed, Excuse me, when you say heavy tailed, you mean infinite variance, right? Yes, right. Excuse me, yes, yes, excuse me. Uh -huh. Okay. So, and then we can consider a random walk Y, which takes place on this environment omega. And this is what we call Levy flight on a one dimensional Levy random medium. Okay. And um, I just want to give you some preliminary definitions. So um, I start with alpha stable distribution. So the distribution of a non degenerate random variable, random variable W alpha is called alpha stable. If there exists a norming constant strictly positive an and bn such that if we consider the partial sum as n of iid copies of w alpha, then it holds the equality in distribution here in display one. Okay, so um, in uh, are necessarily of the form n to one over alpha for some alpha between zero and two. When alpha is between one and two, then w alpha has finite mean, otherwise not. And the case alpha equal to two corresponds to the Gaussian distribution. So it is a known case. Uh, moreover, non-Gaussian stable laws have power tails that scale as in display two when x goes to infinity. In a parallel way, we can define the normal domain of attraction of an alpha stable distribution. So we say that the random variable C belongs to the normal domain of attraction of an alpha stable distribution. Again, if there exists constant Cn and Bn, such that uh, if we call as n the uh, partial sum of iid copies of c, then it holds the convergence this time in its distribution in display three, where w alpha is an alpha stable random variable. Okay, it is known that if alpha is between zero and one, then we have the convergence in distribution in display four. So as n scales with n to one over alpha, and it goes in distribution to uh, an alpha stable random variable, if alpha is between one and two, then it holds this uh, generalized version, we can say, of the CLT uh, describing display five. 
and also it uh, holds a law of, of large numbers, as you can see in display six, because we have a finite mean for XT. Okay, let me start uh, by introducing our the model we worked on, which is a sort of general generalization of the levi lorentz gas introduced in 2000. So uh, I start from the definition of the random medium, namely the environment. So let uh, zeta be a sequence of IAD positive random variables. We assume that zeta belongs to the normal domain of attraction of a beta stable distribution. And we define the point process associated to zeta as follows. So we locate a target or a point in the origin. So omega zero is equal to zero. And in general, omega k is defined as the sum of this zeta if k is positive, otherwise minus the sum of zeta if k is negative. So let's uh, have a look at this uh, picture. We have a target or a point uh, um, uh, in the origin. So omega zero is equal to zero. For example, omega 2 is the point uh, which is at distance, at distance zeta 1 plus zeta 2 with respect to the origin, whereas omega minus 2 is the point uh, located in position minus zeta minus 1 minus zeta minus 2 with respect to the origin. Okay. In a parallel way, we can define the so-called underlying random walk, which is the one, uh, the one which drives the dynamics on the environment. Okay, so we uh, consider a sequence of IAD random variables Xi, not necessarily positive. We assume that Xi belongs to the normal domain of attraction of an alpha stable distribution. And we define the underlying random walk associated to C as follows. So S0 is equal to 0, and Sn is the partial sum up to an integer positive n of Xi. So, for example, again, here in the picture, you can see a possible realization of S. So S0 is equal to 0, S1 is equal to minus 1, then, for example, X2 is equal to 2, and so on. Okay, by putting together these two ingredients, we can define the random walk on the point process Y, which is defined as omega labeled by Sn. So instead of having omega K, here we have omega labeled by this random variable. And this definition is equivalent to considering the composition of omega with S completed in N. Okay, so uh, notice that uh, Yn performs the same jumps as Sn, but on the points of the environment. So again, we can look at this example. If uh, a realization of the underlying random walk is S, uh, sorry, is 0, minus 1, 2, and so on, the corresponding random walk on the point process Y will be omega 0, omega minus 1, omega 2, and so on. So again, we start from the target, uh, from the origin omega zero, then we move to the target labeled by minus one uh, here, and then we move to the target labeled by two and so on. Okay, this is the random walk of the point process. So according to the domain of alpha and beta, we can define the following rescaled processes that you can find here on the uh, items on the left. So, uh, for example, in the first two items, you can see that uh, we have defined a sort of continuous time rescaled version of the underlying random walk. Uh, notice that if alpha is between 0 and 1, then it scales with n to 1 over alpha, whereas if alpha is between 1 and 2, it scales with n, exactly as it happened to the sum of the random variables in the normal domain of attraction of uh, an alpha stable distribution that I showed before. And the same thing happens for omega. Okay, so uh, in our setting, uh, the composition of omega with S returns a process Y. And uh, there is a proper, a, pro a proper scaling for Y that we have identified and is written here on the left, whereby Y converges to a non-null limit. Okay, so um, this, uh, of course, in each regime of alpha and beta. So we are interested in studying the uh, distributional convergence of the process Y. In particular, we asked uh, to which limit process it converges, of course, and with respect to which strongest score mm -hmm. of topology that I'm going to present uh, in a few moments. Okay, so basically our goal is resumed by the display in blue. Okay, so uh, these processes here converge in this space of Cadillac functions. I, I just want to spend um, very few words. Um, so we denote by D uh, the space of functions, which are continuous from the right at every point, and uh, such that uh, the left limit exists, uh, we say, for all T belonging to the uh, domain. In this case, this interval AP. 
So here in this screen, you can see a sample path of our process S, which is a Cadillac function, an example of Cadillac function. And speaking of, speaking of notation, I will denote by D the space of Cadillac function from R to R, and by D plus the space of Cadillac function from R plus to R. And uh, of course, the space uh, of Cadillac function includes all continuous functions. So on this space here, it is, po it is possible to define uh, the four score code topology. In particular, I just want to present you uh, the J1 and J2 uh, metric, mm -hmm. um, because uh, uh, this is uh, the ones that we use in our results. And um, all these metrics are, um, can be considered as a generalization of the uniform metric. Okay, so I want to start from the idea. Uh, let's see uh, the idea of the metric J1. So according to this metric, functions are, cl are, con mm -hmm. are considered closed if they are uniformly closed after allowing continuous small perturbation of time. So uh, let's have a look at this example. You can see on the right this limit function xt, which has a jump at time one half of magnitude one. And on the left, you can see the converging functions xn, which have jumps at time one half plus one over n uh, of magnitude one plus one over n. So both the uh, positions and the magnitudes of the jumps in Xn converge to those of Xt. Okay, and this is a typical property of the J1 topology. So the idea is to introduce a sequence of homeomorphisms such that for n sufficiently large, Xn and X have a matching jump. Uh, I, okay, before giving the more formal definition, I just would like to compare this uh, idea here with the idea of J, J2. So um, according to J2, functions are closed if they are uniformly closed after allowing, again, small perturbation of time, not necessarily continuous. And so again, we can see at the picture. So on the right, you have this limit function GT with one jump at time T bar. And on the left, you have the sequence of converging functions GN. Okay? And you can see that this sequence here oscillate basically around the uh, jump T bar. And uh, okay, so um, in this case, we cannot converge according to the J1 topology because the best we can do uh, by using a sequence of homomorphism is to align just one jump. And so the idea is to replace the sequence of homomorphisms by a sequence of bijections, whose role is basically, roughly speaking, to rearrange the pieces of GN in such a way as they become contiguous and then, re and then they rebuild the one step jump function GT. Okay, so the limit function. Okay, so more formally, I give the definitions together. So uh, a sequence Fn is said to converge to F in the J1 or respectively J2 score of topology if there exists a sequence of homomorphisms or respectively bijections, lambda n, such that both condition 14 and 15 hold. hold. So um, condition 15 tell us that this sequence must be close to the identity. And the condition 14 tells us that uh, um, uh, the composition of Fn with this sequence of homomorphisms or bijection converge, converge uniformly to F. Okay, so of course the uniform metric is stronger than the J1 because uh, <coughs> the identity is uh, um, an homomorphism. And uh, J1 is stronger than J2 because, uh, um, mm. uh, yes, because homomorphisms are also bijections. Uh, okay, so I just want to recall you which was our goal. So our goal is here again expressed by the display in blue. Um, uh, so we want to study the, uh, the distributional convergence of this process Y, okay, with respect to the strongest score code topology. And uh, now I want to present you our results. Uh, so, okay, we start from the, the case when beta is between one and two and alpha is between zero and one. So in this case, we have that uh, we have finite expectation for the variable zeta, which characterizes the environment. Okay, so we define the, uh, uh, okay, sorry, uh, you, in this case, uh, you have that the uh, external sequence of processes uh, uh, omega, converges almost surely to uh, new times the identity in J1, whereas the internal sequence of processes S converges in distribution to an alpha stable process still in J1. 
And uh, if we consider the composition of omega with f, we obtain a process y um, whose right scaling is n to 1 over alpha. And we have shown that this process here converges in distribution to the composition of the respective limits that you can see here. So, uh, this W alpha and the uh, Newton's identity. And this convergence uh, is with respect to the J1 topology. Okay, so second result is when beta is between one and two and alpha is between one and two. And this is the simplest case maybe. And uh, here you say that uh, you have the almost surely uh, convergence for, for both uh, omega n and Sn to a constant times the identity. And these convergence are uh, in J1. And again, you can consider the composition of the processes in this scale y uh, scale with uh, uh, n. And uh, we have shown that y converges in distribution again to the composition of the limit processes. And this convergence is still in J1. Uh, okay, so this is the third case when alpha is between one and two and beta is between zero and one. So uh, in this case, we don't have, uh, um, sorry, we have the finite mean for the random variables C uh, of the underlying random walk. Uh, in fact, you can see that the, there is, uh, um, it holds a uh, convergence almost surely for S uh, according to J1, uh, whereas the external process omega converges in distribution to a beta stable process uh, beta, still in J1. Okay, so um, this is our result. Again, we can consider the, the, the composition between uh, omega and S. In this case, we obtain a process Y which scales with uh, N to 1 over beta. And uh, uh, again, we have proved that Y converges to the, in distribution to the composition of the respective limits. Um, but in this case, the convergence is not anymore in J1, but is in J2, because we are uh, exactly in the situation that I presented before for the uh, converging functions uh, um, when they oscillate around the uh, jump. Okay. And finally, last case, when beta is between uh, 0 and 1 and alpha is between mm -hmm. 0 and 1, we don't have finite expectation for zeta or for c. And um, so we have that the, both the external sequence of processes converges in distribution to a beta stable process and the internal sequence of processes converges in distribution to an alpha stable process in G1. Again, we can consider the composition, and in this case, uh, y scales with n to 1 over alpha times beta. Mm -hmm. And uh, here, we only proved the uh, convergence of the finite dimensional distribution of uh, y to those of the uh, limit z beta composed with w alpha. Okay, so we have a weaker result. However, um, it is in order to remark that uh, the, the trajectories of this composition, the beta with W alpha, uh, are not Cadillac with positive probability. Mm, therefore, uh, um, a, a functional limit theorem with respect to a score of this topology, it's maybe, maybe it's not the uh, natural result uh, that we ex expect. And uh, last but not least, uh, uh, we have proved this uh, um, function, uh, sorry, this central limit uh, uh, theorem. Uh, so when alpha and beta are both in one and two, so we have a finite expectation for both the, the C and the zeta. We can, uh, um, okay, we, we can define the, again the composition of the two uh, sequence of processes as Y, um, which in this case scale with N, as I showed you before. And we obtain three different convergence uh, according to the position of alpha with respect to beta. So in the first case, when alpha is less than beta, we scale with n to 1 over alpha and we converge in, this, in distribution according to J1. In the second case, we scale with n to 1 over beta and we converge in, in distribution according to J2. And when alpha is equal to beta, again, uh, we scale with n to 1 over alpha, which is equal to n to 1 over beta, and we converge the distribution to a sum of uh, um, two independent alpha stable processes, again in J2. So basically here the strategy is to um, express this numerator here by means of two terms. And then according to the position of alpha with respect to beta, you know what is the uh, or, the leading order term in n. So you have that basically one part goes to zero in distribution and the other part goes to something which is not trivial because you have already studied it and you also know the topology. 
and, uh, and so these two, uh, the first two results uh, are quite natural. Uh, the most technical one is the third one, eh? because you have to prove the um, continuity uh, of the addiction with respect to the J2. Um, okay, so uh, this, uh, uh, this is my uh, last frame, which basically resume the, the results that we have obtained, and which are contained in our preprint, which is an archive, uh, Limit Theorems for Living Flights on our dimensional linear random medium. And um, I think I stop here and I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Elena. Uh, does anyone have questions or remarks? Um. Okay, uh, then we'll have uh, another, I'd say, three minutes technical break. And then I shall invite Georgi, mm, Georgi Veprev from St. Petersburg State University. Georgi, are you here? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Okay. So. Mm, is it okay? Can you see the screen? Yeah, uh, you still have like two minutes and then we begin. Okay, thank you. Well, okay, let us proceed. I now invite Georgi Vepriv from St. Petersburg State University, who will be talking about scale and entropy and its applications. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, it's a great pleasure for me to give the talk here and thank uh, organizers for this, for organizing 
Eigenaris in this wonderful conference. So let me uh, full screen, I guess. Uh, it, it's not, uh, it is. Uh, well, I will be talking about some recent developments in entropy theory uh, of dynamical systems. And let me start with the classical approach by Kolmogorov Sinai. Suppose that we have a measure space and some finite measurable partition of this space, then the entropy or Shannon entropy of this partition is this well known value. And then suppose that we have some measure preserving transformation T of this measure space uh, when we define the dynamical entropy of this partition uh, by this limit. Uh, here, uh, psi to the power n is just the uh, join of the first n and the shifts psi by the transformation t. Uh, and then the kolmogorov sinai entropy of this transformation is just the supremum over all finite partition uh, of so supremum of these values. Uh, then, uh, and this entropy plays a crucial role in uh, Gardic theory, so uh, for instance, it solves the isomorphism problem for Bernoulli actions. That is, uh, two Bernoulli systems are isomorphic if and only if their kolmogorov sinai entries coincide. But however, it's still kind of unclear how to uh, separate a system with the same kolmogorov sinai entropy. And uh, even in the extreme case of uh, then the entropy is zero. And what we have in this case, we have by very definition that for any fine partition, uh, this fine function H grows sublinear. And then the naive they could be the following. So uh, let us just change uh, this uh, uh, N by some uh, sublinear phi, uh, function phi. And so let's, uh, look for the limit here. Unfortunately, this approach instantly fails uh, because we uh, can always find a partition whose entropy, wh whose limit here is infinite. So we don't even have a boundedness of this uh, sequence. Uh, then the approach that uh, worked uh, and I would like to talk about is uh, uh, approach by Anatoly Mishich Vyershek. Uh, let me mention some analogies between this approach and classical one, where there are counterparts, and uh, they are the following. So instead of measurable partition with finite entropy, we will consider some measurable admissible summer matrix. I will define that uh, later. And instead of Shannon entropy of a partition, we consider so-called epsilon entropy of uh, a similar metric. Then set of uh, taking joints of partition, we consider uh, the average of uh, some metric over n iterations of t. And then they replace uh, this limit by just, uh, so we want to ask if this sequence is bounded or not. Uh, then, okay, let's proceed to the formal definitions. Uh, so we call uh, a function of two variables, which is summable with respect to uh, square, so near squared, uh, a symmetric if it's non-negative symmetric measurable function, which satisfies the triangle inequality almost everywhere. And uh, there is a very, uh, very important example of such functions. Suppose that we have a measurable partition, for example, finite partition, then there is uh, the corresponding cut symmetric that equals zero if two points lie in the same cell psi and one uh, if uh, they lie in different cells. Then for any such function, we can define uh, its epsilon entropy for any positive epsilon uh, as the following. Uh, well, let k be the minimal integer such that uh, we can find a collection of k epsilon balls uh, such that uh, they have the total measure of at least one minus epsilon. 
this case, we said uh, this epsilon entropy to be the logarithm of k. And if we can't such uh, can't find such k, we put uh, the epsilon entropy to be plus infinity. And what what is uh, admissible symmetric? So that uh, is a, this is a symmetric that satisfies uh, that there are two equivalent definitions. The first one is the following: the symmetric is admissible if it's separable on some subset of full measure. And another one is the following. The symmetric is admissible if and only if uh, all its epsilon entropies are finite for all positive epsilon. So in this case, we call the symmetric admissible. And these admissible symmetrics possess lots of uh, deep, deep properties uh, that I won't discuss now, but we need some uh, really, really evident ones. So, First of all, if uh, rho is uh, uh, admissible, then all its shifts by first first iterations of t uh, are also admissible. And then we can consider the averaging of uh, uh, this uh, symmetric over n first steps of t just by taking uh, so the average. Uh, then what we want to do, we want to investigate the behavior of this uh, function, uh, which is epsilon entropy of the nth average of rho. So the definition is following. We call a sequence hn uh, scaling for a symmetric rho if for any sufficiently small epsilon, uh, this equivalence holds. So this equivalence, this means that uh, uh, up to just multiplicative constant. Uh, then the very, very trivial example is just the following. Suppose uh, that T is just uh, arbitrary rotation of the, the unit circle. Uh, for example, for uh, on the irrational angle, so it's ergodic. And suppose uh, that rho is just the classical inner metric on T. Then rho is uh, just invariant under T and all these, uh, these averages are, are actually uh, the initial metric rho. So this function does not depend on N and we can just put HN to be, to be a constant, for example, to be just one. In this case, we obtain uh, so each n equals one. Oh, sorry. Uh, when we need some um, uh, some technical condition for rho, uh, we call rho generating if there is um, some subset of full measure in X such that for any two points uh, in X one, we can find an n such that the distance between these two shifts is positive. Uh, and of course, any actual measurable metric is always generating because it's always positive. Uh, and uh, if, uh, if we consider a generation partition, then the corresponding custom metric is generating. Uh, well, okay. So the very important theorem in, in this concept is the following theorem about the invariance. Suppose they have uh, a sequence which is a scalar entropy sequence for some just uh, arbitrary admissible generating symmetric role. Then uh, this exact sequence is scaling for any such symmetric. So if it uh, exists once, if uh, it exists uh, uh, always. So uh, this thing, if it, it exists, uh, it forms the invariant of a measure free solid transformations. And to much uh, uh, more uh, non trivial examples are the following. The fact the system has a pure point spectrum if and only if um, uh, this uh, scanning entropy sequence exists and just equals to, uh, to one. And the second example is. Uh, 
the following the Kolmogorov Sinai entropy of transformation is positive if and only if uh, this sequence is equivalent to n. So if the entropy is zero, this uh, sequence, if it exists, grows slower than n. Uh, so what, uh, uh, okay, so this sequence uh, actually has some nice properties in terms of equivalence because uh, it, by, by definition, it, it, define, it is defined after some equivalence, after a constant. Uh, so the theorem by Petrov and Zatitsky is the following. Uh, if such sequence exists, then uh, one can find an increasing subadditive function uh, which is equivalent to Hn. And conversely, for any such uh, given subadditive uh, increasing function Fn, uh, there is also, uh, there always uh, exists an ergodic system uh, which has scalar entropy sequence and it's uh, just equivalent to a fan. So in particular, uh, this term says that there are, uh, uh, there are uncountably many uh, non-isomorphic zero entropy systems uh, which uh, that, that has scalar entropy sequence. However, the, the natural question is, uh, and uh, does this system always, does this sequence always exist? And uh, what if, if no, if we're, uh, so if, if it exists, we call the system stable, and if not, we call it unstable. And so if uh, there are unstable sequence, what is the scaling entropy for, for those? And what happens with subadditivity results? And the recent uh, recent uh, finding was the following. So we proved that uh, there, are, uh, there are such systems. So there is an ergodic system and uh, some admissible symmetric row uh, such that this function essentially depends on epsilon. Uh, that means uh, that for any epsilon, we can find delta such we don't have any equivalence here. In N. Then uh, we actually can give the more general definition and uh, let me mention it. So for, to do that, we need uh, some equivalence relation on functions of two variables. We say that uh, phi is less than psi. If for any epsilon, you can find a delta, some delta such that uh, phi is dominated by psi uh, in n. Uh, then two functions, we call two functions equivalent uh, if uh, so they are dominated by each other. And uh, then we need, to, so we denote the equivalence class of phi uh, by just the square brackets, okay, as usual. So, uh, in this case, the invariance theorem uh, also holds in the following way. So for a given symmetric row, we just call this entropy function as phi rho of n and epsilon. And in fact, if rho and omega are two admissible and generating symmetrics, uh, then these uh, equivalence classes coincide. Finally, we can give a definition of the scaling entropy of a measure preserving system. Uh, it's just the equivalence class for any such uh, generation of miscible symmetry. Uh, well, well, okay. So what about subadditivity? So what we want to do, we want to find uh, a representative in this class, uh, which has some uh, good, maybe uh, nice properties, uh, what we require, we require that this function to be increasing in n uh, while epsilon is fixed, uh, to be subadditive in n when epsilon is fixed, and finally 
to be uh, decreasing in epsilon the n states. Uh, and uh, what we proved, we proved that uh, we can always find such a function in this scalar entropy class. And conversely, for any such function of two variables, we can find uh, an ergodic system such that uh, its scalar entropy is just the equivalence class of phi. So uh, what we what we did, we obtained the complete description of the possible values of this invariant in some sense, in sense of the representatives. Uh, well, uh, now let me, let's proceed to some application of this uh, theory. Uh, first of all, I uh, let me remark that this whole concept works uh, perfectly for amenable groups and actually far beyond the amenable groups. Uh, but, well, let, let me let me just mention how, how to generalize this. Uh, let Suppose that G is amenable. Uh, so we have a sequence of finite subsets in G such that for any element, uh, this limit is zero. Then for any admissible, uh, symmetric row, we can define its averaging over the nth set in our, uh, our sequence by the similar formula. Uh, and then, as before, just consider uh, the entropy function and then take uh, its uh, equivalence class with respect to our relation. In fact, in this case, the uh, invariance theorem also holds, and we obtain uh, the invariant of a measure preserving system. Uh, sorry, he, here must be G instead of T, because we consider the measure preserving actions of G. Uh, well, okay, but we know, and it's uh, very, there is a very uh, famous relation between uh, some kind of entropies for amenable group actions. So. There is a measure theoretic uh, entropy of uh, measure preserving actions, action which is uh, defined for amenable groups similarly to the Kolmogorov Sinai entropy. And uh, there is a topological entropy for, uh, for continuous actions of G. Mm -hmm. And between these two entropies, entropies, there is a well known relation which is called the variational principle. So it says that uh, for any amenable group, uh, the topological entropy of the topological actions is just the supreme of uh, the measure theoretic entropies over all invariant measures in X, X. Uh, and the object what we would like to investigate is uh, this set. So what can be this uh, set of all invariant measures on X, or uh, more precisely, uh, we are interested only in, in ergodic measures. Uh, and that leads to the uh, following uh, definition. So we say that the topological system is uh, universal for some class S uh, of ergodic G actions if uh, uh, every ergodic mu on X uh, belongs to uh, this class S and contrary for any system in S, we can find uh, um, uh, an invariant measure on X such that the, the obtained system is isomorphic to the given one. Uh, some uh, some examples are the following. The very, very uh, simple examples is just uh, the standard shift on the space, which is just a unit segment to the power of G. Uh, so this uh, shift on this space is universal for uh, actually for all G actions. And much more complicated example is uh, uh, the Krieger finite generating theorem. It says that uh, for any ergodic uh, system with entropy strictly slower than a logarithm of n, there is a generating partic 
generation partition with the number of elements uh, less or equal than n. So it's in fact equivalent to say that the Bernoulli shift on the set one and set n to the power g is universal uh, for all actions with entropy strictly slower than the logarithm of n and uh, one more, which is just uh, a Bernoulli uh, transformation with the uniform measure on the base. And there are some, uh, there are also some more complicated examples. Uh, then the question what we would like to answer to is following, does there exist uh, a system which is universal for the class of all ergodic measure preserving actions of zero entropy? So due to the variational principle, this, this system must, ha must have a zero topological entropy. And uh, well, uh, uh, let me remark that for the case of Z, the negative answer was given before by Essex Serafin, but his proof uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't ex extend I ca cannot be extended to the uh, group action because of some uh, because of uh, the uh, it it uses some technique that does not work for the group actions and the, uh, our theorem is the following suppose that we have a non periodic amenable group that means that uh, it has at least one element of infinite order in it. And suppose that we have continuous action of such a uh, group and uh, assume that for any ergodic zero entropy system, uh, there exists uh, invariant measure uh, which represents this system. Then the topological entropy of uh, the topological system is positive. Then by the variational principle, uh, it's easy to see that the universal system can, cannot uh, exist for, for, for such groups. Uh, when, uh, uh, what, uh, why, why, why I mentioned this? Because this theorem is actually uh, uh, an application of this theory of scalar entropy. And uh, the, uh, we found a criteria, criteria that, uh, uh, in terms of scaling entropy, that uh, uh, yeah, if uh, this is true, uh, then the uh, universal system of zero entropy cannot exist. So the criteria is the following. Let me give the definition. We say that uh, group G uh, admits actions of almost complete growth if, uh, for any non-negative uh, function that grows slower than the Follner sequence in G, uh, and for any such function, uh, we can find a measure preserving system such that um, such that its scaling entropy grows slower than uh, also slower than the size of the sequence, and uh, however, it cannot be dominated by this function phi. And in fact, the, this condition is just equivalent to the fact that the measure entropy is zero. Uh, yeah. And so, uh, so the proof is as follows. Uh, first of all, we prove that uh, this is sufficient to the main result. And then we construct uh, uh, such almost complete actions uh, for any non-periodic um, non amenable group. And very roughly speaking, it, it can be done in the, just in the following scheme. We construct such actions for the group Z and then apply the conduction procedure from the subgroup to the whole group G and uh, using some uh, uh, not obvious uh, kind of estimates here, we obtain uh, this, this criteria. And I think my time is over, so thank you for your attention. And um, yeah, so. Thank you, Georgie, very much.
Uh, any questions or remarks? Okay. Uh, if no one has any questions, uh, we are having a lunch break right now and we'll meet back here in exactly an hour. Uh, I guess 3 p.m. Moscow time. Mm, thank you very much.